Breaking news tonight, the verdict in the trial of the armorer who loaded Alec Baldwin's gun before that deadly shooting on the set of Rust. The jury taking just over two hours to deliver the verdict. Weapons handler Hannah Gutierrez-Reed guilty of involuntary manslaughter, but not guilty of tampering with evidence. Our report coming up. Also tonight, the Biden-Trump rematch now set after Nikki Haley announces she's suspending her campaign, but declining to endorse the former president. Now the battle is on for her supporters. The GOP uniting behind Mr. Trump, Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell, after saying Mr. Trump was responsible for the January 6th attack, today endorsing him. The crackdown in New York City, the governor deploying hundreds of National Guardsmen into the subways as transit crime surges. In Philadelphia, the mass shooting near a transit bus, 18 shot. What we're learning in the Middle East, the first deadly attack launched by the Iran-backed Houthis in response to the Israel-Hamas war. The massive cyber attack causing chaos at pharmacies nationwide. Patients blocked from getting their prescriptions. And is this the future of air travel? The TSA's new technology that lets you screen yourself. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening, everyone. Just breaking tonight in New Mexico, a verdict in the involuntary manslaughter trial of Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, the armorer who loaded Alec Baldwin's gun in that fatal shooting on the Rust movie set. Tonight, the jury delivering a split verdict just hours after getting the case, finding Gutierrez-Reed guilty of involuntary manslaughter, but not guilty of tampering with evidence. Cinematographer Helena Hutchins was killed in the incident, and actor and executive producer Alec Baldwin is set to go to trial next. Chloe Malaz has the latest. We find the defendant, Hannah Gutierrez, guilty. Hannah Gutierrez Reed, stoic, her mom emotional, as the jury found her guilty of involuntary manslaughter and not guilty of tampering with evidence. The jury spent just over two hours deliberating. She now faces up to 18 months in prison. During the nearly two-week criminal trial, witnesses described a reckless environment on the New Mexico set, with weapons and ammunition left unattended. This was a game of Russian roulette. Every time an actor had a gun with dummies. And emotional testimony from Dave Halls, the film's assistant director, who handed the prop gun loaded with live ammunition to actor Alec Baldwin. Baldwin fired the gun, killing cinematographer Helena Hutchins. Did you speak to Ms. Hutchins when you approached her? I did. What did you say? Are you all right? Did she respond? Yes. She said, I can't feel my legs. Halls took a plea deal for negligent use of a deadly weapon last year. But the defense arguing Gutierrez-Reed had two jobs during filming, as the armorer and a props assistant. The workplace safety investigator testifying that she was not given enough time to ensure safety protocols were met. They adopted a firearm safety policies, but they totally failed to enforce them. In closing arguments, defense attorney Jason Bowles doubling down on blaming Alec Baldwin, who has pleaded not guilty to involuntary manslaughter. What caused uh, her to pass was Mr. Baldwin going off script and pointing the weapon. Ms. Gutierrez wasn't in the church. She didn't point that weapon. But prosecutor Carrie T. Morrissey not buying the argument, delivering brutal and convincing final words to the jury. She was negligent. She was careless. She was thoughtless. Chloe Malas, NBC News, New York. Let's turn out of the race for the White House. President Biden and former President Trump easily dominating Super Tuesday, unofficially setting up a November rematch. With Nikki Haley dropping out, there's a new battle for her supporters, all as Mr. Trump is calling on President Biden to debate. Garrett Haig now with the latest. This is Tonight, the rematch, though polls show most Americans don't want it. After their massive wins in nearly every Super Tuesday contest, President Biden and former President Trump appear set for another face-off, with Nikki Haley now dropping out of the Republican race. In all likelihood, Donald Trump will be the Republican nominee when our party convention meets in July. I congratulate him and wish him well. Haley then challenging her former boss, whom she pointedly did not endorse. It is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party and beyond it who did not support him. And I hope he does that. The battle now on for her backers. 
President Biden urging Haley's supporters to join him in opposing Mr. Trump, writing, I know there is a lot we won't agree on. I hope and believe we can find common ground. Mr. Trump inviting Haley's supporters to join, quote, the greatest movement in the history of our nation, while boasting Haley got trounced last night. They uh, call it Super Tuesday for a reason. The former president carrying 14 of 15 states in play overnight, NBC News projects, securing landslide victories from Maine to Minnesota to California, with Haley winning only Vermont, allowing Mr. Trump to focus fully on President Biden. He's the worst president in the history of our country. There's never been anything like what's happening to our country. Mr. Trump also securing the endorsement of Mitch McConnell, who had sharply criticized the former president's conduct around January 6th and was the last remaining member of Republican congressional leadership not to support his return to the White House. But today, McConnell praising Trump, writing, During his presidency, we worked together to accomplish great things for the American people. Despite her big defeats, Haley did attract more than a quarter of the vote in many primaries. Trump's challenge, Haley voters unwilling to shift their support. There's no way I want Trump in office. Meanwhile, NBC News projecting President Biden won nearly every Democratic contest, except for a surprising loss in the American Samoa caucus. Recent polls show Mr. Trump leading Mr. Biden in a head-to-head -head matchup within the margin of error. Now the Trump campaign will look to scale up and shift focus towards November. People shouldn't expect a big change in tone or strategy from the campaign or the candidate. Why? It's working. Good. What we're currently doing is working. All right, Garrett, joining me now. Garrett, the former president now challenging President Biden to debates. That's right, Lester. After boycotting the Republican primary debates, Mr. Trump says he's now willing to debate President Biden, quote, anytime, anywhere, any place. The Biden campaign responding, not committing to debates yet, saying they will consider it at the appropriate time. Lester. All right, Garrett Haig tonight. Thank you. Breaking news in Alabama where a final bill to protect in vitro fertilization has passed. This comes after the state Supreme Court ruled that frozen embryos are children. Laura Jarrett now with late details. Tonight, fertility patients and doctors in Alabama anxious to see a new bill signed into law that's meant to shield clinics from costly lawsuits. Under the new law, fertility clinics and companies would not be criminally responsible if an embryo is destroyed, and civil damages are now limited to the cost of one IVF cycle. We have women who have been waiting for this uh, bill to pass and, in fact, anticipating embryo transfers as soon as tomorrow or Friday. The bills were fast-tracked by state lawmakers under mounting pressure to course correct after that Alabama Supreme Court decision allowing three couples to sue for wrongful death when their frozen embryos were dropped and destroyed at a fertility clinic. Multiple clinics fearing the court ruling would open the door to civil lawsuits abruptly halted all IVF procedures. Some embryo shipping companies also pausing all business in and out of Alabama, sending many patients in the middle of fertility treatments to call on lawmakers to do something. But the new bill does nothing to address the underlying reasoning of the court decision, equating frozen embryos to children. We're not addressing this, the core central issue. It's like putting a Band-Aid on a hemorrhaging wound when we're talking about refusing to address the actual constitutional crisis that we have created. Megan Coles, whose surrogate had an embryo transfer canceled last month, cautiously optimistic about this new law, even if only a temporary fix. This has been probably the worst two weeks of our lives. We were devastated, um, and then we heard about this legislation, and so then we became hopeful again. It's been uh, an up-and-down roller coaster. Laura Jarrett, NBC News. Here in New York, a wave of violent crime in the subways prompting Governor Kathy Hochul to order the deployment of hundreds of National Guard members to protect passengers. With more on that, here's Stephanie Gosk. In New York City, subway riders are on edge. I don't feel safe. Crime is rising on the trains, according to NYPD data. In recent weeks, multiple violent assaults, including this terrifying moment, when a woman bashed cellist Ian Forrest in the head, performing on a subway platform, the second time he's been attacked. They say lightning doesn't strike twice, but this was a terrible moment of deja vu. Today, New York's Governor Kathy Hochul said she is assembling a team of 1,000, including the National Guard and state police, to help secure the massive transit system. These brazen, heinous attacks on our subway system will not be tolerated. 
teams will be stationed at the busiest and most problematic stations, searching bags. Civil liberties activists calling it overreaction and overreach. Do you think you will have an impact on weapons getting on the subway with these bag searches? Absolutely. First of all, it's a deterrent. Uh, and uh, if anyone's uh, thinking of coming into the subway system with a weapon, there's probably a good chance they're going to get caught. Mike Kemper is the NYPD transit chief. The big problem, he says, is repeat offenders. We arrest people all the time that have 50-plus arrests, 100-plus arrests. The dramatic moves in New York happening as 77% of Americans are concerned about a rise in crime, even though FBI data shows violent crime has been dropping nationwide since a spike in 2020. But multiple cities are taking steps to crack down. In Philadelphia, the chief of transit police vowing to aggressively combat crime after three deadly shootings in a week involving the city's buses. Eight teenagers shot today alone. We're going to target every criminal code on the bus. In San Francisco, voters passed two measures on Tuesday aimed at law and order, including expanding police surveillance tools with more cameras and drones. In New York City, they will also be adding cameras. In this control center, they can see every station. Soon, they will have cameras on every subway car. Stephanie, as you know, millions of people take the subways here every day. They can't, certainly can't check everyone's bag. How is this going to work? So, Lester, the transit chief says they're going to focus on the busy stations and those places where they've had repeated security issues. These search teams will rotate around. They could pop up anywhere. The transit chief says that is part of the strategy, Lester. Stephanie Goski in New York tonight. Thank you. In the Middle East, there has been a deadly attack on a commercial ship by an Iranian-backed militia. U.S. officials say a missile fired by Houthi militants struck a cargo ship in the Gulf of Aden, killing three crew members. They are the first deaths reported in a wave of Houthi attacks on ships that have continued despite retaliatory strikes by the U.S. military. And we'll turn out of the crisis in Haiti, the prime minister leaving the country and now on U.S. soil as violent gangs overtake most of the capital. The question now, will the U.S. get involved? Let's get more from Gabe Gutierrez. Tonight, Haiti is on the brink of civil war as it spirals into chaos. The U.S., along with a group of Caribbean nations, is pressing Haiti's prime minister to speed up a political transition. Aria Henri had been missing for days but landed yesterday in Puerto Rico. Clashes between heavily armed gangs and Haitian police have escalated after a mass prison break over the weekend. The White House says it will not send in American troops. We have underscored that now is the time to finalize a political accord to help set Haiti on a path to a better future. Right now, the near future looks bleak. Henri took office following the 2021 assassination of Haiti's president. We were there as the violence ramped up. This has become daily life here in Haiti. Tires burning on city streets, protesters furious. Now, gangs control about 80 percent of Port-au-Prince. The State Department is urging all Americans to leave immediately, but the main airport is shut down. In Miami, Haitian Americans are scrambling to evacuate loved ones. Human beings should be to be live in a peace. Not a, in a crime like that. Tony Jantano says his uncle went to visit his mother in Haiti, but now gang members are holding him for ransom. Your family is calling you, crying when you're about to sleep. This is crazy. This is terrible. Right now, it is not clear whether Haiti's embattled prime minister plans to return to the country. The White House said today it is not helping him in Puerto Rico. Lester. Gabe Gutierrez at the White House. Thank you. We'll take a break. In 60 seconds, the massive cyber attack affecting hospitals, doctors, offices, and pharmacies. The impact on patients and what you need to know right after this. We're back now with a massive cyber attack on a healthcare giant and the chaos it's causing for everyone from hospitals to doctors' offices to pharmacies and patients. Liz Kreutz with our report. Thank you for calling Magnolia Pharmacy. At Magnolia Pharmacy in Los Angeles, it's been two weeks of chaos. It's impacting everybody, pharmacies, patients. The pharmacy left in limbo from a cyber attack on Change Healthcare, the nation's largest medical claims processing company that for days has prevented many providers from filling patients' prescriptions. This pharmacy has moved to an entirely new server so they can now process their prescriptions, but it's not a perfect fix. They still can't look at patients' insurance information or take coupons for name brand drugs. 
sometimes it takes one hour to two hours for one single patient to find their insurance. Change, which is owned by United Health Group, says it processes 15 billion transactions a year and works across more than 67,000 pharmacies. The $590 we paid out of pocket yesterday. And, Sienna Keller you know, says she had no choice but to pay out of pocket for what her stepdaughter needs to treat her diabetes. That's a lot of money. Yeah, then I don't know how much longer we could really afford to go through it. Tonight, Change Healthcare not responding to reports it's believed to have paid a $22 million ransom to the hackers. In a statement, the company saying it is working closely with law enforcement and that it's implemented workarounds to help bring some systems back online. In the meantime, experts say patients should ask their doctors about obtaining drug samples or lower cost alternatives. This system needs to get fixed. A massive disruption showing how vulnerable and interconnected our health care system is. Liz Kreutz, NBC News, Los Angeles. Coming up, a look at your money in the 2024 election. Why one bellwether district is ground zero for the strange reality of the U.S. economy. When President Biden delivers his State of the Union address tomorrow, it will be his biggest chance yet to tout his handling of the economy. But in at least one key battleground, many voters say his message is not connecting. Here's Dasha Burns. Daryl Grace has lived in Erie County, Pennsylvania yeah, all his life. Wheel. The former maintenance worker is an avowed Steelers fan and muscle car aficionado. In 2020, he voted for Biden, but three years later, he says the economic growth the president talks about isn't helping him. How does the economy feel to you? It doesn't feel well. You know, it says everything's doing better, but it doesn't feel that way. Daryl's kids, both in their mid-20s and employed, still live at home. When I retired, I didn't expect for my kids to be here with me. You know, I was like, my golden years, me and the wife. You awesome. thought you'd be empty nesters. Yeah, you know, having fun, you know. <laughs> As for his vote come November. If it's Biden and Trump, it's bad. Are you considering going third party? It, yeah, yeah. President Biden narrowly flipped this bellwether county in 2020 thanks to strong Democratic turnout and won the state. But with his approval rating on the economy at just 36 percent, polls show swing state Pennsylvania is very much in play. I think he has done... A good job. Republican turned independent Marianne Frontino is planning to support Biden. We did not go into a recession. It's kind of surprising that people aren't more in support of him. He has a real PR problem, a, a, a big PR problem. That problem for the president is playing out at Eduardo's Tavern, where we met a group of conservative customers. You've got low unemployment rates, wages are up, inflation is easing, stock market's doing well. But are you feeling any of that? How do you feel about the economy day to day? I'm not sure I agree with what you just said. I never planned on using some of the money that I saved to retire that I had to use because of the economy. Groceries, gas, everything you have to buy every day is way more expensive than previous years. Do you feel like there's a, a disconnect between what the, what the Biden administration is saying about how good the economy is versus Absolutely. what you feel? Absolutely. A disconnect that Democrats will have to address this election year. Dasha Burns, NBC News, Erie, Pennsylvania. And up next for us, the future of airport security. Is self-service coming to an airport near you? Finally, with the TSA predicting a record spring break getaway, it's testing what could be the security checkpoint of the future. Here's Tom Costello. If you've learned to quickly check yourself out at the grocery store, the TSA's checkpoint of the future may be for you. Somebody's got to be the guinea pig, right? <laughs> In Las Vegas, the TSA is now testing a self-check point only for pre-check flyers who know the routine by heart. Done this now, I would say this is faster. Faster? Yeah. Is this the future? Could be. Rather than moving travel trays, TSA officers instead can focus on security. Hi there, how may I help you today? with officers on demand to answer travelers' questions. When you're all done, go ahead and slide your items forward. Carry-ons that require rescreening cycle back automatically to save time. And this is what's new. 
you come in and you put your arms down to the side, and it's going to look for anything that shouldn't be there. And it's telling me I got to come back out. I have a microphone, of course, that it's detected. I've got the transmitter on my belt and something a lot of people forget, my cell phone. The Las Vegas test comes as the TSA forecasts another record-breaking spring break season. Already, passenger volume is up 6% over last year. TSA chief David Pekoski. The challenge is to be able to provide the level of security we need to provide with the changing threat environment that we face um, and to be as efficient as we possibly can. After a six-month trial run in Vegas. It was great. Quick. No hassle. The TSA will decide whether any of this technology might come to an airport near you. Tom Costello, NBC News, Las Vegas. And that is nightly news for this Wednesday. Thank you for watching, everyone. I'm Lester Holt. Please take care of yourself and each other. Good night. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.